This week on the Discover the Word podcast, best-selling author Leslie Leland Fields joins the group to talk about following Jesus. We're calling this week Follow Me, insights from a fisherwoman about following Jesus. There was a time I tried to unfollow Jesus. Just a little backstory, I was living on this remote island in Alaska and we were commercial fishing and there just came a point when it was too hard and I just, I tried to walk away. In fact, I did. I did. I got a backpack, I filled it with food and water and a gun for bears and I walked off the island down to a cabin four miles away. And I was there for several days just wrestling with God and wrestling with what it meant to follow Jesus. And so be part of the group as Leslie explores with us what it was like for Jesus' first fisherman disciples to follow him and shares with us five insights into ways God has equipped us to follow him as well. Insights from fisherwoman Leslie Leland Fields about following Jesus on this Discover the Word podcast. And it is great to have you here for another hour of studying the Bible together on Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Our regular group members, Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, and Daniel Ryan Day are part of the group this time. And we've connected via Zoom with author Leslie Leland Fields at her home, on Kodiak Island, Alaska. As you heard, they have a family fishing business there in Alaska, and that will come up often in these conversations. In fact, uh, she asked, will it be a problem if you hear bush planes landing and taking off in the background? Uh, They fly right over our house. And we said, uh, of course not. And so you may hear a bit of that. But uh, Leslie also is an award-winning author, and her book, Crossing the Waters, is one that contains some of the ideas that we'll be exploring together this week. Ideas about following and unfollowing Jesus and some ways God has equipped us to follow him and fulfill the Great Commission. So let's get started with Follow Me, insights from a fisherwoman about following Jesus. Welcome, Leslie. Excited to have you. Hey, I'm so glad to be here with all of you today. I really enjoyed reading your book because I've always been a little bit fascinated by the fishing industry, especially Mm -hmm. up there in Alaska where it's pretty rugged. So how did you get into that? Oh, I wish I had a really dramatic story. But, you know, it's the old, old story of young woman meets young man from Alaska (laughs) at college, fall in love, get married, Ta-da! There I am on this okay. island in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to college in Alaska, Leslie? No, I went to a Christian college in Ohio. So girl meets boy goes to Alaska is still kind of what? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Yeah. You know, it's 5,000 miles away mm. from where I grew up. Wow. Well, but it's where you've been now for decades. You can share how many if you so choose, but it's... Oh, I'm (laughs) fine with that. This will be, and I just counted it up just the other day. It will be my 44th season. Fantastic. Mm. Fantastic. And growing up literally as a young adult into middle and advanced adulthood, the whole context of fishing has become really your context, and and it's affected your understanding of following, too, following Jesus, as some of the disciples were fishermen. So anyway, I'm excited about our conversations that you're going to lead us through on this whole idea of following. I mean, you followed and followed and followed Jesus, as we all have. So where do you want to take us in these conversations? Well, I think there's something kind of at the core of our conversations. And and that is that no matter where you live, you don't have to live in Alaska to be called. Jesus charges us to follow him. And he gives us the most important job in the world Hmm. to go into all the world making disciples. But sometimes I just think, what are you doing, Jesus? You're asking us? You ask those disciples? Those Hmm. guys were a mess. Hmm. And he's asking us too to follow him in this, what we call the Great Commission, you know, to go into the world making disciples. So I want to take us through five sort of fear-shattering ways Mm -hmm. that God has equipped us 
to follow him and to fulfill the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. You said fear shattering, which implies that maybe there's some fears that we are familiar with that you're going to also draw our attention to, I'm guessing. Yes, and I hope you're fearful. You should be. We all <laughs> should be. Because what Jesus calls us to is yeah. immense. It's of eternal significance. And yet I think, oh, Jesus, what? You're calling me? Don't mm. you know who I am? Mm. Don't you know how weak and imperfect I am? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even if the thought for some people of acting on that command and actually doing it is fearful, for those of us for whom maybe the doing it isn't fearful, the sense of responsibility should be. Yeah. So who are we starting with, Leslie? Well, I would like to start with Simon Peter. Okay. I think many people find such a connection, heart connection with Peter, and I do as well. So I wonder if somebody has that passage in front of them, Luke 5, 8, and then 10 and 11, the calling of Peter. Sure. I'd be glad to read that. It says, when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. In verse 10 and 11, Jesus replied to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be fishing for people. And as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. So I want to just back up for a minute and maybe talk about it from our own lives. Here we live, we live in such a competitive world, right? So one year I was applying to teach at a university and I found out later I was competing with 200 other applicants. So, you know, what do I do to qualify to get ready for this? You know, I spent a week or two weeks on my resume. I just polished everything up, made myself look really good. You know, it was all this stress. Only one person would be chosen out of 200. And we all know we live in this fiercely competitive world. If we want that job or want that position, what will we do? We'll we'll clean up, we'll dress up, we'll cover our weaknesses. And it wasn't so different from that in Jesus's day, in Peter's time. There was all kinds of pressure to qualify, like even in the religious realm, in the synagogue schools, who gets to advance Only the smartest, Hmm. you know, the sharpest, the Hmm. brightest, only the best could follow a rabbi. Hmm. So this is what blows my mind. When Jesus wanted to have followers, to have people join him in his mission to bring the gospel, where did he go? Well, any other rabbi would go to the synagogue school because that's where all the smart people were. Jesus did the opposite. He turned in the other direction down to the beach Hmm. where the fishermen were drying their nets, mending their nets. It's an incredible thing right there. Where does he go? It's almost like an illustration of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, where he says, for not many wise or mighty or well-known, but it's the weak things that confound the mighty and the nothing things that confound the something. It's almost like this is a living illustration of that idea. Yeah. And it seems like also what we're like subtly saying is that Peter didn't make the cut at some point. He was disqualified in some way. And so he's back to doing the family trade of fishing because at some point in his young life, he didn't measure up to whatever the standard was. And that's the reason that he is fishing in the first place. Daniel, is that because all boys would go and be taught by rabbis and then if they didn't cut it, they would find a different profession? To my understanding, there was at least the pressure to memorize Mm -hmm. big chunks of what we now call the Old Testament. And so especially the Torah, the first five books, and then a lot of pressure to memorize other sections of scripture. And then Part of the testing process was for rabbis to ask lots of questions to see how well you not only internalized the memorization, but then how well you were able to interpret it as well. I don't know for sure that like all young Jewish boys had the same access to follow a rabbi, but in some way, Peter is left out of that. Hmm. Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong in this, but it seems like all boys had the opportunity up until bar mitzvah. And once they became a a son of the law, that was kind of the point where, okay, now the cream rises to the top and everybody else go get a job. 
Yeah, I think that's right. And my favorite part of this story is the moment when Peter qualifies to become a disciple. And we just read that passage in, in Luke. And the backstory of that is Peter had been out fishing all night, had caught nothing. And so we see he's not even a good fisherman at this point. <laughs> right? At he, least he's doesn't bring, feel like one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brings his boat to shore and there's Jesus. And Jesus asks him to, hey, you know, put your boat back out. I want you to try again. And Jesus tells him to do all the wrong things from a fishing perspective. It's morning, the sun is out, and he tells him to, you know, throw his net on the other side of the boat, this side of the boat probably where the, his shadow is over the water and the fish can see the shadow. You can't catch fish like that. Says the fisher woman. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but of course, the net explodes with fish and, and then Peter is buried. And this is like his fishiest dream has just come true right? It's the catch of a lifetime. Mm. And in that moment, he knows those fish came out of nowhere. He looks at Jesus. Jesus is there in the boat with him. And in that moment, he recognizes, who is this man? And he Mm. falls to his knees. And seeing the face of Jesus causes him to see into his own heart. And he knows he sees his sin. He said, Lord, you have to leave me. You have to go away from me. I am such a sinful man. And that's the moment when Peter qualifies Hmm. to become a disciple. That's the moment when Jesus says, don't be afraid from now on. You're going to come with me and we're going to fish for people. So I find such hope in this moment that what Jesus is looking for is not this perfect resume. It's not, we don't even have to be a good fisherman. We don't have to be a, you know, the best and brightest synagogue student who's memorized, you know, the five books of the Torah. We just have to recognize our need and our nothingness, our emptiness. We have to recognize our sin. Yeah, somebody said the ground's always level at the foot of the cross. So none of us are more qualified or less qualified. We're just all there in need. Yeah, and it's also interesting, too, that in Peter's moment of looking at Jesus and say, go away from me, that's when Jesus moves closer to him and says, no, not only am I not going anywhere, but I want you to walk with me. So we've just seen the calling of Peter and Jesus said, you know, I'm going to make you a fisher of people. And it says, Peter did it. He dropped his nets and followed Jesus. So now my question is, all right, what's going to happen next? Okay, now Peter is following Jesus. So, you know, surely life is going to be wonderful. Mm. It's just going to be all, you know, happiness and joy. But very soon we are in the boat with all of the disciples in a massive storm. And these guys are going to (laughs) die. So would somebody read this story? It's Mark 4, 35 to 40. I'll start it off, Leslie and uh, Elise and Daniel, if you guys want to jump in. Mark 4, 35, and on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the multitude, they took him along with them, just as he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. And he said to them, Why are you so timid? How is it that you have no faith? Yeah, I love this story. I really connect with the story because I've been out in a lot of storms Mm. on the water in Alaska because uh, I work in commercial fishing Mm. with my family and we work out of boats that are just a little bit smaller than their boats. Their boats were somewhere between 25 and 30 feet and ours are just a little bit smaller than that. And so one time in particular, I'll tell you this one story. I was in a boat alone on the water, in winter, Mm. in a snowstorm. What is wrong with you? Yeah, I know. (laughs) I know. And that's what my husband said, too. So this uh, blizzard just completely swallowed me up. And I was lost for I don't even know how long it was. 
I tried not to panic. I could not see anything. I had no idea where I was for mile after mile. I kept looking for a beach to be able to land my skiff and just to wait out the storm, but there were no beaches. It was just cliff, 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 cliff. And then, just when I thought nothing could be worse, my engine died on me. So now I'm dead in the water, very close to the cliff. I'm, you know, could be smashed against the cliff in just in minutes. And I realized I could die um, because Alaskan waters in the winter, of course, are very, very cold. If I go in the water, I will be dead in just a few minutes. And there's nobody around. People are many, many miles away. Mm. I was a Christian. I knew Jesus. I was like Peter and gave my life to follow Jesus just a few years before, and here I was fighting for my life. Hmm. And so I shouldn't have been surprised. You know, we we know from the scriptures, we see in the scriptures that choosing to follow Jesus doesn't automatically end all storms in our lives. And I think sometimes we have that expectation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and sometimes we're shocked when it happens. And I don't know, have you had that experience of a storm in your life? And you think, but wait, I'm a follower of Jesus. This shouldn't be happening. Yeah. Now, Leslie, in the way you're asking the question, you're kind of saying that storms mean more than being stuck on a boat in the water in Alaska. So if I pick up what you mean by that, then the storms in my life that I have run into are uh, experiencing sickness in our family that isn't going away, Mm. experiencing broken Mm. relationships with very, very close people to me that I haven't heard from or seen in a very long time and that I can't reach out to, Mm. to try to fix those things. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the storms that even though I am a Christian, And I want to follow Jesus. Those are the storms that I have run into. Thanks, Daniel. That's so honest. And I echo that a thousand percent. And some of mine too have been when life just goes contrary to what I would think God would allow. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying my best to serve him. And it's like the floor falls out from underneath me. Maybe it's a financial situation. Maybe it's a health situation like you mentioned. or, Or maybe it's choices of others that impact mine. I think for me, the storms that are the worst are the ones that are the consequences of my own choices. Mm -hmm. Um, Because those are the ones you feel like, if Mm -hmm. only. Because, you know, back to what you were saying, Leslie, you know, we think that if we're following Jesus, you know, everything's going to turn out okay. But the reality is that God may forgive us for some of our choices, but he may not necessarily remove the consequences for some of our choices. So, yeah. Yeah, and if we can just step back into that boat with the disciples for a few minutes, just to understand the depth of their confusion and the depth of their fear and really um, angst, I want to say. So remember, Jesus is sleeping Mm -hmm. in the boat. In the midst of the storm, and it says that the boat is about to swamp, so that means waves are washing over them. And there is no Coast Guard. They are not wearing life jackets. If they go into the water in this kind of storm, they will die, and they know it. And in the midst of that, Jesus is sleeping. There's one more detail that Mark tells us, that he's sleeping on a pillow, or another (laughs) translation would be he's sleeping on a cushion. So there are um, scholars, biblical scholars, who believe that it's actually a buoy Hmm. for the sea anchor. And the sea anchor is the only thing they've got to give them a little bit of stability in the storm, in the waves. What you do is you throw that sea anchor over and it'll just kind of slow you down. It'll, it just gives you a little bit of stability. So there's Jesus. He's not only asleep, but he's asleep on the one thing that might help them a little bit. (laughs) Wow. Hmm. And so I think we feel that sometimes, right? That frustration. Yeah. And I think Mm -hmm. when you see this level of panic, in their minds, and you know that they're professional fishermen who've spent their whole lives on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, that speaks itself to the intensity of the problem, because these are guys who've been there, done that. And yet here, there is a tangible anxiety that they're feeling. And and then on top of that, it's just like Jesus is totally removed from that. <laughs> That's a good way to put it. If you are a strong fisherman and you look at this dude, you think you don't understand that you're sleeping on the one thing we need. You're not only asleep, but you're sleeping on the one thing we need. You have no clue about fishing. 
And that's what we say to God sometimes, isn't it? You have no clue about my life. Yeah, I think it also may be, and like so much of this is conjecture, but why? Why is Jesus able to sleep in this moment? So much of the time he talks about this relationship he has with the Father where there's just this trust between the two of them that, you know, my Father and I are one and I abide in his love. And then Jesus invites us to abide in that same love. And so there's this like trust, this dependence that he has Mm -hmm. on the father that I wonder if that's the reason that they, he doesn't need the sea anchor (laughs) and he can sleep on the cushion. But also he can maybe, and you're right, Daniel, we're speculating now, Mm -hmm. but it also may be an indication of Jesus's humanity that, I mean, he's been through a really difficult time of ministry where he's been expending himself to such a degree that even in the midst of the storm, yeah, he's knocked out mm-hmm. uh, just from actual human physical fatigue. And for the Jesus who walks on water, to see that Jesus, that weary, perhaps, that he's sleeping in the middle of that storm, really makes Jesus feel very accessible to me. Mm-hmm. You know, that question of once we follow Jesus does that mean all storms will end? We all are saying with a resounding you know, cry, no, we know there are going to be a lot of storms in our lives. And I think this story is so important to recognize that, you know, Jesus does, and that storm, remember, he stands up and he rebukes, he rebukes the wind and the waves, and he says, peace, be still. The thing is that Jesus has calmed the one storm, the one storm we cannot, absolutely cannot survive. And that's the storm of sin and death. And that's why Jesus came, to calm that storm, to end that storm once and for all. So I'm out there, right? I'm in the yeah, boat. you got to hear what happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to, yeah, so I realized, okay, you might did want, you I don't know, do you want to know the end? <laughs> I did. And, and the ending is really kind of amazing. I'm standing there in the boat. The boat is now dead. I'm just a few feet away from the cliff. And I just called out to God, like, Lord, help me. I'm at the end. There's nothing else I can do. And in that moment, the snow stopped, the fog lifted, I could suddenly see hadn't been able to see for an hour or two. And there, half a mile away, was a beach. There was one little beach that I could row to and be safe on. I rowed over to that beach. And, you know, I have been in a number of other storms, literal storms and figurative storms. And the thing is, I know that even if I went in the water that day, another day I was in a plane that almost hit a mountain, I knew that even if I hit that mountain, even if I went in the water, I was still going to be safe. I was still going to be safe because Jesus was with me. And in those moments when I felt like I'm going to die, I had a profound calm entered my heart. And it was knowing that Jesus was with me. And knowing that if the plane hits a mountain, if I go into the water, it's okay. I'm still safe. Jesus has ended that one storm, that I cannot survive that storm of sin and death and separation from God. If we know Jesus as our Savior, not even death can separate us from God's love. When we follow him, we are safe. He has calmed the one storm that we can't survive, the storm of sin and death. Well, another insight from our special guest for this episode, Leslie Leland Fields. And this episode is titled, Follow Me, Insights from a Fisherwoman About Following Jesus. And when they continue, Leslie takes us to another passage and insight that is actually about unfollowing. Uh, the disciples all did that at at least one point. Uh, Leslie shares about her struggle to unfollow. And I'm pretty sure everyone who's followed Christ has wrestled with that desire to unfollow at times. And so that insight comes up after this. Leslie Leland Fields is an award-winning author. And during this episode of the Discover the Word podcast, we'd like to highlight one of her books titled Crossing the Waters. Now, this book was the winner of Christianity Today's 2017 Book Award for Christian Living and Discipleship. Now, Leslie lives on an island in the Gulf of Alaska, on a bay, an ocean bay about the same size as the Sea of Galilee, 
where she and her family have a commercial salmon fishing business. And she says she finds it amazing that Jesus chose fishermen as some of his first disciples. So in this book, Leslie takes you around her island and the waters where her family makes her living for the purpose of diving into the Gospels to follow the disciples as they follow Jesus. And in the process, she helps you discover that as you follow Jesus, you can count on him to rock your boat as you discover what it truly means to follow him. We encourage you to get a copy of Leslie's book, Crossing the Waters. We have a link to it on our discovertheword.org website or look for it on any one of the online booksellers. That's Crossing the Waters by Leslie Leland Fields. And now that conversation about when we want to unfollow Jesus. I want to talk this time about a part of my story that in some ways is really hard to share, but I think it's important to share Mm. because I think we've all come to these points in our lives. And this is one of our connections with Peter and with the life of Peter. So there was a time, maybe eight or 10 years into my marriage, when I tried to unfollow Jesus when I tried to walk away from everything hard in my life. And just a little backstory, I was living on this remote island in Alaska and we were commercial fishing and my husband and I were working together. We were trying (laughs) to work together, let me say that. And there just came a point when it was too hard and I just, I tried to walk away. In fact, I did. I did. I got a backpack. I filled it with food and water and a gun for bears. And I walked off the island down to a cabin four miles away. And I was there for several days just wrestling with God and wrestling with what it meant to follow Jesus. I had um, said yes to Jesus about 10 years before as a teenager, but life was so hard and it seemed like life got harder rather Mm -hmm. than easier Mm -hmm. in following jesus yeah and a couple of questions in there well this is silly but how do you walk off an island is it like a peninsula or something yeah so there's a at a low low tide there's a spit that i was able to to walk off that's thanks see you know the region and i'm like huh (laughs) the other thing is that i'm hearing and thank you for your honesty leslie in this time of unfollowing jesus it sounds like you were considering unfollowing commitments as well. It's like, you know, I, I want to follow you, Jesus, but I don't want to be in this marriage or do this job or, you know, be on this island or whatever it is. That that's kind of how we manifest it at times. Is that what you're talking about a little bit? Yes, absolutely. And sometimes we're just absolutely overwhelmed. Like, Jesus, how is this happening? Do you really love me? I think we question his love. And we question ourselves, too. Mm. Lord, you chose me, but this is too hard. I can't do this. I don't want to do this anymore. It sounds a little bit like you've taken where we were in our last conversation, Leslie, where we were talking about storms in life and the fact that following Jesus isn't all hearts and flowers. But you've taken that to a different level, that this is not just the normal, everyday troubles and trials of life. This is an experience that really is, I just rather step off the cliff kind of moment. Yeah. And I wouldn't want to put words in your mouth. So please let me know if this isn't accurate, but it's almost like going from discouragement or fear or whatever in our last conversation. And this is almost like despair, Mm -hmm. like something has to change and it's kind of all building up and cascading together as I just need a change from everything. And it's profound self-doubt and self-disillusionment that what's wrong with me, you know, Hmm. part of this is what's wrong with me that I don't think I'm following Jesus well. And that's this deep connection that I feel with Peter Mm -hmm. on the night that Jesus was arrested and taken away. You know, Peter had expressed this complete confidence, even 
if everyone falls away, not me, you know, I Mm -hmm. am going to stick by your side even till death. And so death suddenly appears, a threat appears. Jesus is arrested and hauled off. And how does Peter respond? The opposite of what he expected. He runs the other way. He flees for his life rather than trying to save Jesus's life. And Mm -hmm. I felt that same deep sense of disillusionment with myself. Like, why can't I follow better? (laughs) Why can't I do this? Yeah. Uh. Theodore Roosevelt talked about while daring greatly, you know, to dare greatly, you run risks. And one of the biggest risks is failure. And and I think all of us who've ever tried to do anything that felt a little bit beyond us know what it's like to fear failure. And yet to make the promises that Peter made and then to fail in the spectacular fashion that he did in the presence of Jesus himself— you can almost understand how shattering that would have been to him. And we think he's going to get it right, right? Because he's the only disciple that's following Jesus from a distance even, right? They all ran away and you have Peter at least that's kind of remotely close to Jesus. But then when the test really comes, when the pressure is really there, he walks away. Of course, this isn't the end of the story. And that's why we wouldn't be sitting here today talking about this <laughs> if the story ended there, right? So there's this incredible moment, these moments when something happens on a beach with fish and with bread. And um, this is in John 21. So we're going to go there in just a moment. I'll have somebody read that. But remember, Peter has fled from the events that are unfolding that horrific night. Jesus is arrested. He is hammered to the cross. He is buried and he is resurrected. So Jesus has now risen from the dead. And here comes this scene on the beach. So could somebody read that? Sure, I'll grab it. And um, just the context is the disciples had been out fishing And they're returning. And this is where we pick it up in uh, John 21. When they got there to the beach, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire and some bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now, come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. And here's the thing. We think that when we say yes to follow Jesus, we think it's all on us. It's all about us. And that there's so much pressure to follow him perfectly, to follow him well, to never fail. And yet Peter had this colossal failure. I had this colossal failure. I ran away <laughs> off my island, away from Jesus, saying, I don't even know if I want to follow you. I don't even know if I can follow you faithfully, Jesus. And yet Jesus comes after them. I mean, he comes with breakfast. You know, he <laughs> comes yeah. to serve yeah. them and he feeds them love. He feeds them restoration. And that's similar to what happened for me down in that cabin where I was wrestling with God, like, God, how can you love me? I am a failure. I'm trying to follow you. I Jesus did meet me there. Didn't bring me fish. <laughs> <laughs> I had to go out and catch those myself later. <laughs> but Jesus came with his love, with his courage. He enabled me to get up, pack my backpack, and walk back those four miles back to the island, back to restoration with my husband, back to recommitment, back to new growth and new life. And that's exactly what happened Mm. for Peter. And Jesus did the same thing for me in my Mm. moments of unfollowing him. Yeah. You know what else is striking me too is Jesus is doing something that God is kind of known for throughout the whole story of the Bible, like with Israel. Israel is in the wilderness without food. And one of the first things God does is provides food, provides water. Elijah runs away in fear. And the first thing that God does is not to deal with his fear, Mm. but to send an angel to make the best I can tell they were pancakes (laughs) on a rock, right? And feeds him. (laughs) And then Jesus, right, feeds the 5,000 feeds the Mm 4,000, feeds Mm -hmm. his disciples at the last dinner before he dies. 
and then we see food here, it's almost like the first thing that God does when he meets us is he meets us in very practical, real ways. He's not just concerned about what's going on in our hearts and our souls. He's also concerned about physically what's going on with us and meeting all of those needs. You even think about the Jewish tradition of Passover Mm -hmm. and how that meal itself is just kind of the focal point of all of Israel's history that they get to rehearse every year and they do it over food. Mm -hmm. And it's so unexpected because you think about Peter and the disciples, they, they ran away, they deserted Jesus, and Jesus has the right to come back and maybe confront them yeah. or at least address it. Why did you run away? Why He doesn't say a word about that. He simply comes bringing food and love and restoration. Mm. Even when I fail, even when I feel like I have unfollowed or denied Jesus in some way, that he will never fail to mm. come after me. So I think this is one of the profound truths about following Christ. When Jesus, you know, called to us, come, come, follow after me. But it also meant that he would come after us, even in our weakest moments, even in the moments when we feel like we have failed him the most. Yeah, following Jesus goes both ways. We follow him and he follows us. Such a comforting reminder for times when we feel like we're stumbling in our Christian walk. Even when we try to unfollow Jesus, he still comes after us. That's a great insight in that conversation. This is the Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and special guest Leslie Leland Fields. And an episode called Follow Me, Insights from a Fisherwoman About Following Jesus. And Leslie says this next insight flips our notions of success and power on their head. And so let's see what she means by that. Hey, everyone. It's great to be back. Thank you for this time together and this conversation. It's good having you around because I don't know that I've ever actually talked about the Bible with a professional fisher person before. Yeah. And I have a question about that because you've been talking (laughs) about fishing in Alaska and like All I have in my head is deadliest catch. Is that the type of boat that you're on is one of those big giant things and... Oh, you're going to be so disappointed. No, it's not (laughs) quite that dramatic. It's, you know, we're in small boats, like 25 to 28 foot boats open. We call them skiffs. Mm -hmm. And we are on the ocean. We are out in the ocean, but we're not, you know, those guys on the deadliest catch. They're fishing for crab, usually in the winter time. And Mm -hmm. they're way, way out in the middle of the ocean. We're close to shore. We're a mile, half a mile off the shore. And what are you fishing for, Leslie? Salmon. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And you use nets and stuff like that, right? Yes, yes. So we fish with nets and our nets are attached to shore. So it's a different kind of fishing than most people imagine. There are actually like five different gear types for fishing for salmon. And we're a particular gear type. But, you know, there's a lot of similarities to the New Testament fishing. And it's been awesome to look into some of these passages, but especially the characters (laughs) that we're relating to of those who were choosing to follow Jesus and what that looked like for them on the water. Yeah, and it's always been something that intrigued me. Um, Of the 12 disciples, it's very likely that six of them were fishermen. Hmm. And so that's always a question, why why did he choose fishermen? Mm -hmm. And so that's what was part of the prompt for me to dig into this book and really explore that question. Do you think it's called fishermen by nature or just really easy to get along with and nice people? (laughs) There you go. Uh, That's not why he chose that. (laughs) That is not quite. You know, fishermen do have, there is this profile. I think they're super hardworking. They're optimistic. Hmm. You know, Peter was fishing all night and he caught nothing. That happens to us a lot. There are days and days and days sometimes when we catch nothing. But you know what? We keep going out. Hmm. We keep going after it. We keep hoping. We keep believing. And just a net itself thrown into the water, I think, is a profound act of faith. As someone who has a great love for salmon, I thank you for your work. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. 
As we continue thinking about following Jesus, where are we going? Are we going to stay in the water for our conversation today, or where do you want to take us? Today, yeah, we're going to go somewhere further and deeper. And I want to back up a little bit and kind of remind us where we've been, because there's kind of a progression here. We started off with the calling of Simon Peter as a fisherman, calling him to follow Jesus. And Simon said, yes. And all those other disciples said, yes, to following Jesus. So the question is then, okay, what happens after we say yes to following Jesus? And then we jumped into a storm, a massive storm. So we we remembered this reality that saying yes to following Jesus doesn't keep us from all storms. But we saw that Jesus had power over the storm. In the last conversation, we looked at ourselves. What happens when we fail Jesus, when we fail to follow? When I told you about a time when I unfollowed Jesus, when I denied him and looking at Peter's denial and fleeing from Jesus on the night of his betrayal. Today, I want us to look at the power that Jesus gives us to follow him. It's an upside down power. It's not Hmm. what anybody expected. I'd like us to read Luke 23, 32 to 34. I've got it. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. What we are faced with here is an image and a reality of the deepest possible failure Mm -hmm. and devastation. When the disciples said yes to following Jesus, they had a very different image of where this was going to go, of how this was going to end up. They had images of success of course. What's going to happen when the Messiah comes? Everybody's waiting for the Messiah to come. We know what's going to happen. The Messiah is going to restore Israel. The Messiah is going to bring political power. He's going to bring military power. We're going to be back in charge. We're going to crush the Romans. The Romans are our oppressors. We're going to be back on top. Right? Israel is going to be great again. This is what they were expecting. This is what they signed on for. Mm. And we jump to the end of the story and we're met instead with this image of absolute devastation. The Messiah, rather than crushing the Romans, was crushed by the Romans. The Messiah, rather than triumphing over the oppressors, was crucified by the oppressors. So it raises a really big question. Wait a minute, we're following Jesus, and what what are we signing on for here? Mm-hmm. And the crucifixion turns our notions of success, our notions of power, absolutely on their head. Now, Leslie, if I'm following you correctly, it seems to me like we have a different challenge than they had because we're on the other side of the resurrection and we know what happens next. But when they signed up, they didn't have that. And so for them to see Jesus arrested and taken away and to know that he's been crucified would have felt very different, it seems, because they don't yet understand the resurrection's coming. So how do you compare that with what we face Although, Bill, I would push back on that a little bit because Acts chapter 1, Jesus died, he rises again, and the disciples' question to Jesus in Acts 1 is, all right, oh, now must be the time that you're going to fulfill the expectations that we Mm -hmm. had of you throwing off the Romans or whatever that picture. I mean, there was quite a spectrum of expectations of what the Messiah would do, but their expectation seems to come a little more clear in Acts 1, where it's after the resurrection, and they're still expecting him to restore Israel. And, you know, the reality is that even today, I mean, I can slip into this formulaic thinking that Jesus is going to order my world, my universe, my country, you know, my daily life, 
according to, you know, on a trajectory of upwards and to the right, you know, that it's all about growing and it's all about increasing and it's all about what I view as success. And the reality is God is above all countries. God is above all people. God loves all of us and has plans that he's leading all of us to accomplish. And they are not always up and to the right. You know, many times they involve down and to the left, if you can use that analogy a little bit. And it's really tough to understand that. How is he going to use illness? How is he going to use poverty? Why doesn't he just fix all of this? I think about the disciples, what their emotions and thoughts must have been as they see Jesus crucified, which is the the most horrific, tortuous, humiliating death in the whole Roman Empire. Surely they were thinking, you know what? We followed the wrong man. Mm. He can't die in a cross. So there had to be this profound disconnect between their images of the Messiah and success and following him and what actually happened. And I think we experience that today too. I think we have expectations of what it means to be successful in the kingdom of God and what it means to be a successful follower of Jesus. Do you find that as well? What are some expectations that you have, you know, spiritual expectations from following Jesus. I mean, don't you want to see your churches full? Don't you want to see people lined up to be baptized? And Yeah, I think when, again, I'm still kind of stuck on, I think we face the problem a little differently because we have more information than they did. But when it comes down to how you measure success, I think you're absolutely right. And I think some of it is because they were measuring success in a, if I can use the word worldly, they were measuring success in a worldly way, political conquest and freedom. We in church world tend to measure success in a worldly way with numbers and growth and nickels and noses and all that kind of stuff. And so I think there is, when it comes to the success part of it, I can see the real correlation you're taking us to. Yeah. And I think the core issue here is how does Jesus empower us to follow him? Where does this power lead? Is it going to lead to our churches being full, to, you know, lots of baptisms, numbers, all of that? What is this power? And Jesus on the cross, his arms open wide, that image is ultimately, we know, it looks like weakness, but it's it's strength. It looks like failure, but it's triumph. The power that Jesus demonstrated and that he gives to us is the power to lay down our lives as well. And maybe that's not what we think we're signing up for Mm -hmm. when we follow Jesus. We want to be successful. We, you know, have all of our kind of worldly images of success, but Jesus leads us to the cross. He leads us to a completely upside down measurement of success. This is what success looks like. We win by losing. We live by dying. The disciples were still after power. You know, we see that when the soldiers come and they start fighting back and Jesus says, lay down your swords. Mm -hmm. This is not the battle Jesus came to fight. And this is not how Jesus is going to win. He's not going to win with swords. He's not going to win with military power. He's not going to win with political power. He's going to win by laying down his life. Yeah, this is the insight about following Jesus that flips our notions of success and power, as Leslie said, on their head. It's a completely different, counterintuitive way of living life. Well, we will wrap up this episode of the Discover the Word podcast with uh, one more insight from a fisherwoman about following Jesus after this word about our next podcast. On the next Discover the Word podcast, Bill Crowder leads Marty Hahn, Elisa Morgan, and Daniel Ryan Day in some conversations about Jesus, the priest. We have a lot of titles that come to the front of our minds when we think about Jesus. And I think for many of us, the first thing we do think of is Savior. But it's interesting that one of the most important roles that Jesus plays for us right now 
in this moment, not in Bible days and not in future days uh, of the end times, but right now at this moment, one of the titles that the scriptures give to Jesus that we don't think about as often is the title of priest. Yeah, be part of the conversations about Jesus the priest next time on the Discover the Word podcast. And now one more insight from fisherwoman Leslie Leland Fields about following Jesus. Leslie, thank you for these conversations. I mean, I don't know many fishermen. I don't know any fisherwomen like you. So it's awesome <laughs> to have your perspective, but to really be thinking about what it means to follow Jesus, what we run into, what fears we bump into. And actually, I, I'm excited to have a whole conversation about your story with Erin Eddy on God Hears Her Too, so we'll get a little bit more of that there. But thanks for being here. Thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I love love talking about fishing, love talking <laughs> about in all the ways that it opens up, really opens up the gospel to us. Mm. I think your experiences resonate so well with Peter and the other disciples that were fishermen in their own country in their own time that it just makes for a lot of neat connections that I don't know that I would have ever really thought of. Yeah. And I really wasn't that disappointed that your fishing experience is not like the deadliest catch. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you for leading us this week. It's been great. So we have one more conversation to have. And as we're considering following Jesus and what we bump into, where do you want to take us now? I want to take us to this um, final moment between Peter and Jesus. And here's the question I want us to be thinking about. How can God ask us, us, me and you and Peter, how can he ask faulty, weak, imperfect, human, running away us to go out into the world to make disciples. Does God know what he's doing? Does God know <laughs> who he's asking to be mm. on his team? That's my initial question here. Yeah, I think built into that question, right, is an assumption that we recognize that we are weak or faulty or running away types of people. And so maybe it's helpful for us just to remember some of our earlier conversations where we admitted that we don't have it all together. You know, one of the things that I've learned the super hard way is that, Leslie, I tend to focus on what God wants to do through me for him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like I think, oh, that's the whole deal. But I've learned that he cares just as much, if not more, about what he's doing in me as what he's doing through me. And that's, I think, my answer. And it comes from a lot of hard lessons to this question of why would he choose us? Because, you know, while he does want to use us, it's us <laughs> that he loves. It but, is. Yeah. It is. It's us. And could we jump right now into the passage? Let's look at this moment when Jesus and Peter, and we've already been here at the breakfast scene, right? When Jesus brings bread and fish to the, uh, the fire. And now we're going to go a little bit further the, to the conversation that Jesus takes Peter aside. So this is John chapter 21, 15 to 19. Okay, I'll start it off. Verse 15, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. Verse 16, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Then verse 19, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. <laughs> oh, there it is again. Mm. Right there it is again. Follow me. So we recognize in this passage that Jesus is giving the great commission to Peter. And of course, we don't forget he's giving this commission to someone who has just denied and run away from him. 
And here's my connection to Peter. Here's our connection to Peter. Jesus comes to us and asks us to follow him in bringing the gospel to all of the world. Mm. And he's asking us, we who have run away from Jesus, you know, multiple times, we who have failed him. And, you know, from a human perspective, this is just craziness. And I think back to when I first started in fishing, I was given the easiest job. (laughs) Okay, Leslie, you stand there and you hook the net. Okay, that was my (laughs) job. And as time went on, I was given more and more responsibilities until sometimes I was running the boat, which was really really scary. How could my husband entrust me with running the boat with a crewman under my charge out on the dangerous ocean? You know, and I made mistakes all the time. I ran into the net. I, you know, lost fish. My husband was asking me, calling me to something that was so hard that felt like it was beyond my abilities. And so just imagine that. Now here's Peter being asked to going to all the world with the most important news that anyone can bear, the news, the good news of Jesus, the good news of the gospel. He's entrusting that to Peter. How absolutely frightening that must have been. And yet this passage resolves and shows us the way forward for every single one of us. How do you see that? Where do you see that? Yeah. So it's this conversation that the two of them have. And the question that Jesus asks Peter is not, okay, Peter, are you ever going to make a mistake again? He didn't ask that. He didn't say, Peter, are you ever going to run away from me again? Peter, are you ever going to be overwhelmed with fear again? Didn't That's that's not what he asked. That's what I would have asked. That's not mm-hmm. what Jesus asked. Jesus asked one question. Do you love me? You know, and Peter's just, yes, Lord, you, you know that I love you. And most of us know that this is repeated three times, this exchange. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. And we see that as the restoration and forgiveness of the three denials. No, I don't know the man. Yes, I love you. Mm. So that's beautiful. And that's the healing and restoration. And every time that Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you, Jesus doesn't say, oh, that's nice. Okay, now you're fine. No, he gives him a job to do. You love me? Okay, then. Hmm. Feed my sheep. You love me? All right, then. Take care of my lambs. And the message is clear. Love is enough. Our love is enough. But I still want to say, wait, 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 wait a minute. Do you know what kind of love I have? Hmm. You know, yes, I love Jesus. Yes, Peter loves Jesus. But it's not like your love. Jesus's love is perfect. It's holy. It's sovereign. My love, it's small. It's human love. It's finite love. It's imperfect love. Jesus, you're telling me that this love, this imperfect human, frail love that I have for you is enough to fulfill the Great Commission? And it is enough. Hmm. I'm reminded earlier in this gospel, the gospel of John, Jesus in chapter 15, 11 times says, abide in me. And one of those is abide in my love. And so there's like this new covenant, this new promise, this new command that Jesus gives, which is to love others, but that that flows out of first this love that he pours out on us and in us that yes, brings reconciliation, right? Like he has with Peter. But then it also fills us, empowers, equips us so that where our human love continues to break down and fall apart and deny and run away, Christ's love in us is what can help us to love others the way that God loves us. What a radical shift, you know, from the Old Testament where we were told to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and strength, etc. in our minds. And, you know, the reality is we could never love enough. And that's what you're bringing up, Leslie. We're stuck in our not enoughness. But Jesus' provision on the cross, his invitation to abide in his love, his providing the Holy Spirit, he's answered us with himself so that now we are able to love him because he helps us love him. Yeah, and Jesus is this God who 
is a God of multiplication. And we saw it right at the beginning, the calling of Simon Peter. Out of no fish, Jesus brings this explosion of fish. We see it in the feeding of the 5,000 out of a handful of a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish. Jesus multiplies. That's what he does. He takes the little bit that we have to offer and he multiplies it. So this whole question, what do I need to follow Jesus and to fulfill this awesome commission to go out into the world with a gospel? And I hear Jesus asking me, just like he asked Peter, Leslie, do you love me? I say, yes, I do love you, but it's just small love. It's just my small, imperfect human love, but it's okay, it's enough because Jesus is love will make my love enough. God's love will make our small human love enough. Yeah, that is another great insight. Thank you, Leslie, for leading us in these conversations about what it really means to follow Jesus. This is the Discover the Word podcast with Elisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and special guest, author, and professional fisherwoman, Leslie Leland Fields. We're wrapping up an episode called Follow Me, Insights from a Fisherwoman about following Jesus. And at the beginning of that last conversation, Elisa mentioned the God Hears Her podcast from Our Daily Bread Ministries that she also hosts, and uh, that they had Leslie on as a guest on that show not long ago. Well, I'd encourage you to listen to that podcast. You'll get more of Leslie's story, and I think it'd be a great follow-up to being part of these conversations on Discover the Word. Go to GodHearsHer.org and search for episode number 56, The Adventure of Faith. That's a great episode with Leslie Leland Fields at GodHearsHer.org. Now, our mission in all we do here at Discover the Word and Our Daily Bread Ministries is to make the life-changing story and wisdom of the Bible understandable and accessible to people all around the world. And so if you'd like to come alongside and partner with us in this ministry, we invite you to lend your financial support. Simply go online to discovertheword.org and click the Donate button. You'll see some options and you can give right there. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedinga. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries.